Is balanced one of them, in your opinion? Oh, the market's trying to balance itself. I love that you pulled the one minute chart out. You must have been hitting the double shot espressos this morning. <laughs> so. It's high octane trading when you go with the one minute. So, yeah, we saw, you know, there's that gap there on crude oil. It's uh, like 75.83. I was just pulling it up on the chart. That was the high from when uh, we shot the gap up. Now we filled it to the downside. We're probably going to go back up, run up again. So we snapped back from the oversold territory here when we had that massive dip down. EIA right now, we're pumping about 12.5 million barrels per day. So we're at like one of the highest levels that we've been producing. The API came out yesterday up 3.6 million barrels. Today, we just got the release. They're expecting a drawdown of just under a million barrels. So you look at, you come back and you look at the bigger picture here. We got four 459 million barrels of crude oil in inventory, according to the EIA. The five-year average is 468. You break down to gas, 222 versus 237, and the distillates, 110 versus 126. So a lot of concern there about, you know, supplies are pretty tight. And I was just saying that it's like, you know, although you could produce this high amount of crude oil a day, that's like getting a paycheck every week or every two weeks. It doesn't mean that you should draw down your savings account. You want to have that savings account there in times of emergency. And I think with the geopolitical situations, things are a little bit dicey globally right now. You want to start to restockpile that SPR. I just want to take a look here at crude again on the daily time frame and uh, kind of tying it into, well, uh, along lines of what you're talking about, uh, price at the pump here. I've got RBOB on the right now, crude on the left. We've seen price at the pump remain stubbornly elevated off the extreme highs that we were at last time, but uh, supplies do remain pretty tight. And I, I think that uh, we're seeing a reflection of that. I mean, one would argue, yeah, it's great to see crude off those spike highs we saw last year, 120, 130, but at 75. It sort of feeds into that narrative of what we've heard from Powell about deeply entrenched inflationary pressures. Oh, yeah. And, and to touch base on that gasoline, um, there is a seasonal that came out. It was at the start of May. It was buying the August RBOB. It's worked out 12 out of the last 15 years. It tends to go up into July. So you'll see that they draw down those inventories. That's why we're you know well below the five-year average. They try and build up, but they're more playing catch-up. And that's why crude oil and gasoline get drawn down right into that summer driving season. So, you know, we're still looking at, um, you know, crude oil, whether it could fill that gap. Couple levels to look at. 200 day moving average, 78.64. We got that to chew on the upside and then an $80 psychological level as well. Okay, we'll keep an eye on those levels. We'll keep an eye on the uh, OPEC report tomorrow, the EIA later this morning. Let's talk a little bit about China because when you're talking crude, obviously that feeds into the demand narrative. Our guests keep talking about how well the anticipated demand from the reopening never really developed. No, and, and if you look at that trade balance data that came out, those mm -hmm. imports were pretty weak. They were kind of shockingly weak. So all the commodities that China generally imports, you know, everything from like cotton, uh, their copper consumption, that crude oil, all of them were hit to the downside. Silver, a little bit of weakness as well. All the grains have come off. So China's really slowed down quite a bit. And I heard something out there that they were actually looking at getting funding from some Middle Eastern countries in order to um, stimulate their economy, which is not something they normally do. They usually cut the reserve requirements or they just flat out provide stimulus. So they're kind of going, uh, they're drifting astray on what their, their normal playbook is. So we got to watch it. I think that they don't want to build that inflation back up, but they also don't want to look like their economy is not doing well at also. Phil, I like that you tied metals into the discussion there. Uh, with China, obviously, copper, a big part of that, not just in terms of crude demand, but uh, consumption there, as you mentioned, significant. And, you know, as I look at the chart here, uh, similar to what we've been talking about in terms of multiple major markets, right? Copper, you've got the highs from last year up around uh, $5. You've got the lows that we saw uh, last summer around 3 And here we are, for the most part, smack dab in the middle, hanging out on the 50-day moving average at 4 I mean, this is a reflection of what we're talking about, right? Markets that are in balance, waiting for more information and uh, still kind of uh, waiting for that China trade ultimately to develop. 
Yeah, you look at copper, it's kind of near this triple bottom here, 382 level. Um, that's been kind of like the banking crisis low, another low, and then this recent low. So we're going to look at buying some support right there. Okay. CME launched those micro contracts, which are fantastic. You really balance things out. And those options, all of a sudden, copper options are liquid because these guys got to, you know, hedge their, their delta and, and their risk here on the options. So a lot of, lot of good liquidity in the copper market. Platinum pushing out to the upside, breaking out uh, that crossed over 1100 that's probably your best looking metal on the charts gold here we got to get above uh, that 2056 then we can make another run for the most contract highs in today's key level on the silver market 2606 we get above there we could be making another run on up to 28 2606 in silver we're looking at gold here right now this is another chart as i look at this it's kind of mid-range hanging out rotational overlapping somewhat sideways uh, i just want to quickly pull up the daily time frame so we can kind of put this on into perspective because you were talking about a, a bit of a double bottom triple bottom i think it was you mentioned in, in terms of copper and we've seen a bit of a triple bottom in gold 16 18 last fall september october november before takeoff in the uh, move up we've seen recently to 2085 Phil, with what we're seeing in the U.S. dollar, we're going to talk currencies in just a couple minutes here, but uh, what are you looking at here in terms of gold, expectations for a new all-time high? I mean, we'll kind of just continue to knock on the door. Yeah, the problem that, uh, that gold could have, if you look at that daily euro chart starting to roll over, could break the neutral trend, come off that bullish, go to neutral. Then on the dollar, if you draw this big downward wedge pattern, looks like it's kind of knocking on the door to the upside. Not saying we're going to enter a bull market or a bear market in the euro currency, but they are looking at some material changes here. You've got a, uh, a Bank of England meeting, so there could be a lot of discussion as far as, you know, boosting their, their um you know, their interest rates and things like that. It could put some some upward or some downward pressure on that euro currency, uh, a little bit of boost on the dollar, and that's how that gold market come back. We really like gold uh, going to those deferred contracts, the December one, just under that 2,000 mark. So we'll see when we get that gift. We're looking at the well-defined inverse correlation between the dollar and gold, and uh, I like what you're talking about in terms of the euro currency because I've been pointing to uh, some of the foreign currencies as the tail that's been wagging the dog here. So uh, it's kind of working your way down the chain here ultimately in all of these markets which are so intertwined and co-related. Phil, appreciate you joining us here to help us break it down, taking a look at what's going on in terms of commodities as we head into a very closely watched CPI number. Phil Striebel, Chief Market Strategist at Blue Line Futures, speaking 